Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining this webinar. My name is Jada Shapiro. I'm the founder of Boober and Birthday Presents. Boober is a platform where parents can go to find all of their pregnancy to postpartum care providers, anywhere from birth doulas to postpartum doulas to lactation consultants to now mental health therapists, which we just launched this week. And because of the COVID-19 situation, we know that anxiety is high and is up and we really really wanted to get the resources that people needed out there. We are doing everything virtually right now. So you can come to Boober and find somebody virtual. Um, I have been a birth and postpartum doula for almost 18 years and have been doing this work and just trying to help people get the resources that they need at my other company, Birthday Presence. We provide childbirth classes um, that are now all going virtual this week as well. So if you need support, resources, anything, please just reach out to us, text Boober, and we are here for you, and we will try to find the resources that you need and the support that you need um, and, and all of that. And I'm really excited today to have uh, two amazing people. We have Dr. Jacqueline Worth, who is here, who is an OBGYN, um, and we have Dr. Julie Capiola, who is a pediatrician and lactation consultant. And um, we tried to record this before and it didn't work. So for those of you who came on and couldn't actually join, even though you registered and it didn't let you in, we're doing this again. We really, really appreciate that you put aside the time and we know you wanted to hear from us. So we are here today um, going. So I'm gonna just allow Dr. Worth to introduce, um, if you could introduce yourself and then we'll just jump right in with some questions for you as the OBGYN and then we'll move along quickly to um, Dr. Capiola, who's the pediatrician and lactation consultant. Go ahead, Dr. Worth. Hi, Jada. This is Dr. Jacqueline Worth. I'm an OBGYN uh, with a private practice in New York City, Village Obstetrics. Um, I have privileges at Mount Sinai Hospital on 99th and 5th. Um, I, I started a midwife practice, Village Maternity, and I, I co-founded with Dr. George Musali. And I was also so lucky to participate in a book, The New Rules of Pregnancy, with Dr. Adrian Simone and Danielle Clara. So um, thank you for having me here today. Yes, thank you so much for coming. And, and, and Dr. Capiola, if you want to introduce yourself real quick. Sure. Hi, I'm Dr. Julie Capiola. I'm a pediatrician with Premier Pediatrics in New York City, in Brooklyn, and we have an office in the Rockaways. I am a partner and owner of the practice. We've, I've been with the practice for 12 years, and I am also, as Jada mentioned, an internationally board certified lactation consultant. So that is a particular interest of mine as well. Thank you so much. So Dr. Worth, um, what a lot of people want to know, are pregnant people more susceptible to the coronavirus? Great question. And I have good news about that question, which it does not seem as if, to the best of our knowledge, pregnant women are any more susceptible than anybody else. There is, however, the concern, um, if you consider other COVID viruses, that pregnant women may, if they get sick, may, uh, be susceptible to a more serious form of it. So, you know, you're not off the hook, but if you're not any more susceptible. Thank you. And what can pregnant people to do? What can they do to protect themselves right now? Uh, the biggest advice right now is social distancing. Um, you know, we should all think about every single place that we go, really try to stay in the house, have your house be a clean zone, take your shoes off, change your clothes, uh, be sure that you've cleaned all the surfaces. I mean, not to make you paranoid, but be sure your home is clean and then try to stay home as much as you can during these next few weeks. I, I, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, we need to social distance so that we're not getting sick or making others sick. It's super important. Thank you. And would you recommend that if someone, you know, um, if someone is coming in for routine appointments, normally when you're pregnant, you have a lot of appointments that you have to make with your midwife or doctor. What would you recommend? Are we skipping any of these appointments? Are we doing them by telemedicine? What are, what are you doing for patients and what, do you, what should people do? You know, as we, were, as we were saying before, this is a rapidly evolving situation, but I can say what I'm doing in my own practice and what my hospital is advising me as well, which is um, we should definitely um, spread out appointments as much as possible, cancel unnecessary appointments. And in my practice and at my hospital, they're encouraging us to do telemedicine. So by telemedicine, I'm offering every patient in my practice the option of doing the visit through Zoom, which is a HIPAA compliant portal, a, a confidential video portal, where I can speak to them, answer their questions. I'm asking my patients to have a home blood pressure cuff, a home scale, a home ear thermometer, and I'm sending my patients a urine dipstick so that for the routine visits or when we're spreading out the visits just a little bit, you know, we can avoid 
you know, the risk of traveling to the appointment. That's a really great solution to know about. So parents out there, you can ask your OBGYN or your midwife, what are the plans to help um, do the appointments and learn the information that you need when you're not able to go in? Um, you know, of course, I, I need to mention that when one is doing that, you're not checking on the baby's heartbeat, and that is a critical component of the visit. So you need to use judgment about whether that visit can be done virtually, you know, obviously. Right. Yeah. right, that's really important. So talk to your care provider about that in each case. Um, if someone is pregnant and gets coronavirus, can it be transmitted from the pregnant person to their baby? The best data so far suggests that it can, it is not, trans, there's no vertical transmission, that it's not transmitted to the baby. However, um, and this is something um, that will address that when the baby is born, there may be, there probably is droplet transmission so that if the mom is COVID-19 positive, and she's holding the baby in her arms, it is possible that it could be transmitted at that time. So that's an issue for breastfeeding. Right, and actually it's a great time, Dr. Capiola, to jump in there and, and talk about that, that A, is, is the issue, you know, that the, the virus passes through the breast milk, or is it more, from my understanding, that is about the droplets and, and what can we do to protect the baby if the, the parent is infected with COVID-19? So we're using data and information from other coronaviruses because much is still unknown about the spread of COVID-19. Um, but mainly we think it's spread via respiratory droplets and contact. Um, but we've used information from SARS to kind of find out about this and make some good educated guesses about it. Thank you. So we'll come back to that a little bit later. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that all the expectant parents are really concerned about, you know, right now is what what will happen in the labor and delivery wards? Like, what is the protocol? What, what happens if the labor and delivery wards become a bit overwhelmed and there's not enough space? Is that an issue you're foreseeing or how are the hospitals potentially dealing with that? What are you seeing? Um, great question. So, you know, if you, um, if a patient has COVID-19 and comes to the hospital in labor, there are clear protocols to protect the patient and protect the staff and protect everyone from um, exposure. Um, you know, the standard hospital protocols. Um, you know, you'll be screened on admission and you'll be taken to a, a private room with, um, you know, I, I won't go into all the details, but basically feel confident that you'll be protected. Um, obviously, none of us can see the future and know what will happen if there is just a massive outbreak of disease in the city. You know, I'm confident um, that the hospitals will be safe um, and that the New York City mayor will make appropriate plans. I think we just have to take this on a day-by-day -day basis. My hospital has a separate entrance for labor and delivery, um, a separate building. I, I can't see unless, I, I can't imagine that, um, that that won't all continue. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I guess we always bring up also the other question that parents are asking about, well, what if I am low risk? Is now the time to consider having a planned home birth? Also, they're asking, what if I can't get to the hospital because of lockdown or whatever is happening? Should I plan to what we, we have been reading about calling birth in place? Um, what, is, what is the preparation one should do if I have to have a home birth? Sure. So really important question. So if, um, you know, I, I have two answers to that. First of all, I've been asked by patients in my practice, you know, should I switch to a home birth midwife? And they've been calling around to try to find home, home birth midwives. What I have been told by these patients is that the home birth midwives are all completely booked. So I think that, that right now there just is a real strain on resources. I don't think that that's a realistic um, option right now in New York City. Um, I, you shared with me the resources from um, ACOG about birth in place, sort of the emergency preparedness information. I think it will relieve anxiety on the part of patients to review that information. Perhaps you can post it at the end of this webcast and um, show patients what they would, you know, if God forbid there's a total lockdown on the city and you're in labor and you're at home and you can't travel. Again, I can't imagine any of those scenarios, but at least you would, you would have what you need at home and you would call 911 and talk to the 911 operator and be coached through the procedures. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and we will, um, we wrote a Boober blog about that had some of those questions in there. So you can look on the Boober blog um, and you'll be able to see that. And we'll also send out the link to people after, which has the link to the ACOG link um, for birthing in place. 
Let me ask you a question about doula care. That's one of the issues a lot of expectant parents who have doulas right now who are supposed to be coming with them to labor and delivery. My understanding is that some hospitals are limiting the amount of people, um, extra visitors or specifically doulas. Um, I've heard things about you know, greater, greater tightening of the rules. So I would love to hear what your hospital is doing, what you, how you feel about doulas. And do you think, you know, will you accept virtual doula care? That's something at Boober that we are now providing where people can find a, a doula virtually so they can actually have somebody who can sit on the laptop and, and be with them and talk them through it if they can't actually be with them. In the hospital, we have a lot of people who currently have doulas right now who are trying to figure out how to shift into a virtual space, and I would just love to hear your thoughts on doulas. Absolutely, I mean, this is a, a big topic of the day. Um, you know, it's especially important to me because 99% of the patients in my practice use a doula for the incredible support that they provide, and I'm a firm believer in that as a, a key player on your birth team. Um, and so this is what I'm telling my patients, that your doula will continue in her same role, teaching you ahead of the birth, uh, coming to your home, ideally, if, if you feel that safe and she feels that safe in early labor, um, coaching you through early labor, helping you get to the hospital. And then I think the only adjustment that we have right now because of these emergency situations is that once you get to the hospital, at my hospital, your doula would no longer be able to support you in person. And so I would recommend that you bring a laptop, that you get a Zoom connection, and that you put her you know, that you continue to have her coach you through the end of labor in a, a virtual capacity. Um, I think that's the situation for this emergency situation. Um, I was reading that just a few hours ago that there's a San Francisco hospital that is even um, not allowing um, any family members, not even husbands and partners into the, into the hospital in labor, you know, quote unquote, let us be your family. So I think this is an area where it's changing very rapidly and we need to just be flexible and adjust. Definitely, thank you. And um, one last question that's come in a, a bunch. Um, people who are fairly close to their due date, should they be thinking about having an induction right now? Um, what's your thought on that? Um, so to just to bring people up to speed in case they don't know, you know, the due date is 40 weeks. And so um, induction of labor is permitted in any circumstances at 39 weeks, a week before the due date. And so if it would give you confidence to ask your doctor for that. It's not unreasonable. It's, it's not a bad request. It's a, a reasonable request. Um, however, I do feel, you know, that the data says that induction of labor tends to be a longer labor, a longer exposure to the hospital. On average, it's about 20 hours. And so a, I, you know, I believe a better plan is be in spontaneous labor if you can, um, come to the hospital, have your hospital time be as brief as possible, and ideally even leave at 24 hours so that your time in the hospital mm -hmm. is as short as it can be. I think that's the best plan for now. Okay, thank you. And, and the last question for you before I move on, um, we had questions about are, are people more susceptible to miscarriage? Um, what should you know first and second trimester people or, or very early third think about? Uh, I don't think there's any evidence of that at this time. So more good news, <laughs> if you could say there's good news. Yeah, and we're gonna quickly shift on now to Dr. Capiola. Um, Let's say, big question from a lot of people, is it safe to continue to breastfeed um, or start breastfeeding if you know I'm asymptomatic, but I, I'm not sure if I've been exposed to the virus and I keep breastfeeding? It's, the answer is almost always that breastfeeding is better for the baby because of all of the protective benefits and antibodies that breastfeeding provides. So yeah, that's the answer to that. We can get into more severe illness if you'd like. Great, now let's leave it there for the moment. So keep yes. breastfeeding if you're already breastfeeding yes. um, and that's fine. If you don't know if you've been exposed, what if I know I have the disease or suspect I have the disease, now should I continue to breastfeed? Um, what about pumped breast milk? How should I, you know, should I express my breast milk? Should somebody else be feeding my baby? How should I protect myself and my baby? So if you are ill or you are under a person under investigation, a PUI, or you have known COVID infection that's positive on lab testing, um, then a lot of care needs to be taken to prevent infection spreading to the baby. Children and infants, especially those under 10, have fared very well in all of the literature we have with regard to COVID. That is one of the silver linings. I'm a mom of three, so I can at least feel reassured that children do very well. Um, but we still need to be cautious and we still would rather not spread an infection that we don't know a lot about to an infant or 
toddler, et cetera. Um, and so good hand washing, and there's lots out there about good hand hygiene and how long to wash hands that I don't need to reiterate and potentially wearing a mask if you're doing any direct feeding of the baby. All other care should likely be done by someone who is healthy. Um, an alternative that may be a little safer version would be using the good hand washing, a mask, and then doing and pumping milk, mm -hmm. express breast milk so that someone else who is healthy can, um, can feed to the baby and then do all of the intermittent baby care that needs to be done. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and if I have a newborn, just going back to in this time, I have a new baby. Should I come to my first visit? Should I come to my subsequent visits? Am I supposed to be minimizing the amount of pediatric visits that I'm doing in this time period? What is your recommendation? How is your office protecting um, patients? What's What are you guys doing? And so at this time, on this date, March 15th, you know, pediatricians are taking a lot of care to make sure that the office is safe. And there are a lot of benefits to that first newborn visit because even though there's COVID, there are a lot of other medical issues that need to be ruled out and addressed and dealt with if they are happening, because I wish all of that other stuff would go away and we could be reassured, but we can't right now. So babies can have significant weight loss and they can be quite jaundiced and those are two potential emergencies in this newborn period. So babies do need to be assessed by a pediatrician after leaving the hospital within a few days. As for follow-up appointments, that can be taken a number of ways. And I think a conversation with the pediatrician about the frequency of those visits, or whether those visits can be in some way made virtually, like by, we've talked about before, having a scale at home. Normally, I would say no way, it's anxiety provoking, this is a terrible idea, people get obsessed with weights, but under close guidance with a pediatrician and weights every couple of days, taking particular attention to the baby's wet and dirty diaper patterns. I think that, and maybe even sending some pictures, practicing the telemedicine that we are all trying to start um, at this time of a pandemic can all be helpful to keep our babies and our families as safe as possible. So a conversation to decide on follow-up is extremely important with your pediatrician. Also, asking your pediatrician how they are managing infection control procedures in the office. I would, if you don't ask that, because we are all inundated with a million things. Can you say oh. that again? Yes. So I would ask your pediatrician, uh -oh. can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, good. Okay. Is that so a we're having a little, we're having, I'm having a little technical difficulty hearing. Can you hear her? I can Dr. hear her. Dr. Worth can hear me. Okay. Hang on one good. moment. Sure. Is that better? Should I keep talking? All right. So you know if I hear you? Yes, that's better. Now you can keep okay. Yes, go ahead. So I think talking to your pediatrician about whatever infection control measures they are using in the office is going to be very important at this time. I mean, ours are evolving by the day, but we keep up to date with CDC and World Health guidelines about safety. Perfect. And um, one question from mm -hmm. out, a couple questions from out in the world before we, we kind of wrap this up. Um, sure. I, we have somebody who has a six week old who is currently eating breast milk only. Um, they have such a small apartment that they don't feel that they can safely, you know, um, quarantine if one of them were to get sick and they're wondering, is it better if one of us gets sick, should we send the baby to a family member somewhere else? Should I, or should I keep the baby with me because I've already exposed my baby and keep feeding breast milk which has the antibodies i know it's a hard one what would do you have this any is a nearly a, this is a nearly impossible question because all of the different possibilities place someone at risk probably it's best to keep the baby with the lactating parent because of the protective benefits of the breast milk unless of course the baby the mom cannot take care of herself and then i think we're in a different scenario okay but that could change in a few days i just want to clarify my statement of course, yes. This is all a today's information. It's evolving. It's evolving. It's evolving every day. We might need to do this again. I want to just really um, thank both of you for coming to talk to the Boober and Birthday Presents community. Um, and we have so many questions that are happening right now constantly. So um, if you, do either of you have a last statement that you'd like to, to suggest right now? Anything you'd like to say, Dr. Worth, in closing? And 
Yeah, no, just ha hang in there. Today is Sunday, March 15th, so we're stating the date because, again, this is changing every hour almost, but hang in there. Uh, you know, we're all going to be okay. Take care of yourself and your family. Thank you. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Mm -hmm. yes, thank you so much. So we'll send this out, and we might have you back again as the situation evolves. Um, thanks again, and we'll talk soon. We thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Worth. Thank you, Jada. Thank you. We'll be honored to return. Thank awesome. You. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.